Welcome to this webinar focused on how an impact analysis for COVID-19 could be created. Why is the Legatum Institute undertaking this work? We are a think tank focused on creating the pathways from poverty to prosperity. And COVID-19 is probably the single greatest disruptor of building prosperity for any nation. So we wanted to understand how to ensure the best decision making could possibly take place at this point in time as we are focused on working our way through a global crisis and how we could protect our nation's prosperity. Addressing the COVID-19 pandemic is a complex and emotive issue. For good policy making, we need to understand the impact of different policy options. Impact assessments are best practice for government policy making. And although this is a particularly difficult impact assessment to create, we still believe it is really important that at a time of national crisis, good policy making and decision making still takes place. So though it is a difficult exercise, as you will be about to see, it is a worthwhile exercise. As we embarked on whether it was even possible to create an impact assessment, we set ourselves a number of goals. First, to develop a framework for understanding how COVID-19 and the various policy choices being taken impact on overall prosperity. Second, to build on existing best practice in epidemiology, economics, and other social sciences, as well as the process of policy making in government. Our goal was then to populate this framework that we created, this best practice framework, as, as well as possible with existing information. We do not claim to have all the right numbers in the presentation that you are about to see but we have taken the best numbers that we can find in the public domain. We wanted to surface the trade-offs inherent in this area of policy, and we wanted to identify where better information was needed to build consensus around the assumptions that underpin this approach, and to provide the tools for government and others to build on this and use the framework as one part of, policy, of the policy-making process in the future. Ideally, this consideration should have been taken in March, but understandably, we were in the middle of a global crisis. Given the multitude of decisions and events that have taken place since then, it is too complicated for us to go back and review every single one of those decisions from March until now. So we've chosen to illustrate the impact assessment approach by taking the 31st of October decision to move from a tiered system in England to a national lockdown. So as my colleague, Dr. Stephen Bryan, goes through this, we ask you to focus on the framework that has been created, on the way in which you can go about creating an impact assessment. As we said at the beginning, the numbers that government will need to insert within it, but this is an approach, a way of tackling uh, a challenge and doing it according to best practice. I now hand over to Dr. Stephen Bryan. Thank you. So let's start with a picture that we all saw at the end of October, where through, for example, Google data or through some of the ONS um, analysis, we could see that mobility around the country was moderating slightly. Uh, since the tiered system had been in operation, workplace mobility, particularly in tier three areas, had been reducing, and there had been a general national reduction in the level of mobility to retail and hospitality. So there was a moderation, but I think as the right-hand side of the slide shows, infection rates and hospitalization rates, and ultimately, tragically, mortality rates were continuing to rise. So that's the context the decision makers were confronted with when at the end of October, they needed to review the policy for England. And what had to be considered was the sense that if there were not any further reductions in mobility, there was a significant risk of a 
second peak. However, there was also a balance to be struck because such reductions in mobility that would help reduce infections and ultimately hospitalizations and mortality would also have negative economic and social consequences. So really, one level, it's best to see the government having two choices, two types of decision to make at this point. Firstly, what should be the reduction in mobility and mixing to help contain the spread of the virus, balancing all the other considerations? And then secondly, what are the policy levers available to achieve that mobility reduction? Should it be through regulation? Should it be through changes in guidance? Should it be through public health messaging and people self-regulating? So these are the two layers that we think are necessary to think through and analyze this decision. Now, as Philip has indicated, this is a very complicated problem. There are many moving parts and many dynamics that any analysis has to care for. So if we start in the middle and we think about social behavior, uh, the core of both what's going to trigger the epidemiological consequences, but also the economic consequences. So we need to think about the level of mobility, the level of mixing, types of commuting, and so forth, that are existing and that are being carried out in October, and how might they be modified? And to what extent do they impact on the epidemiology, on the infections, the hospitalizations, the mortality? But also, going down a step, to what extent do they impact on the economy? The level of output and production, the unemployment level, and so forth. Now, of course, the level of the epidemiological phenomenon have a critical factor to informing the public through the media, through government notices and so forth. And that also has an effect on the form of self-regulation. As you see in the different tiers with different levels of infection, people responding in different ways. And also, the government has to consider its policies, which are informed by both the economic projections and the health projections and the economic and health projections having informed government policy, that then affects the behavior of the, the population at large, and ultimately the cycle continues. Now, to constrain what we think about to start with, we're just gonna look at that bottom right-hand corner of this slide, where we look at the relationship between mobility and epidemiology, mobility and the economy and society, and work out what does that look like and then the second layer is what are the policy options to deliver that level of desired level of mobility. Now, as you're doing that, thinking what is the desired level of mobility that helps provide the balance? There are decisions to be made on both sides. Reducing mobility has benefits. It has a health benefit of fewer COVID infections, lower mortality, lower morbidity, as a result of both COVID cases, but also non-COVID cases. Because as NHS capacity is depressurized, there's the potential to bring back those cancer cases, the uh, cardiology wards can reopen and so forth to help deal with the fact that through this pandemic, many other lives have been at risk because of the fact that the NHS has not been able to service them as it typically would. That, of course, is offset by greater mortality and morbidity that would come from a lower level of economic activity. The recession that would be induced by the lockdown would cause poverty and unemployment, which is well established over a multi-year period to create further health problems. Other benefits, of course, from reducing mobility come from lower emissions and pollution, lower levels of violent crime, albeit again, domestic violence has gone up when there has been greater uh, social isolation. And then on the other side of the ledger, we need to think about the economic impact. Lower economic impact output that would come from less mobility, greater long-term economic scarring, higher unemployment and debt. Education has been impacted and would be impacted further by uh, reduced mobility, classes would have to go online, social isolation would be increased and so forth. And then on the social dimension, greater levels of reduced overall well-being. As people are not able to meet with friends and family, not able to pursue their lives with the freedoms they used to have, that has an impact. As would we find greater levels of depression and anxiety, and the long-term impact of poverty would also play out in people's well-being. So these are the trade-offs that have to be made. Now, when we think about it, we have to do a whole set of layers to this problem. We have to think about the relationships between mobility 
and infection rates and hospitalizations. We need to think about the relationships and quantify them between mobility changes and the economy, and also the mobility changes and the social impacts that we have just talked about. We then need to find a way of trading them all off against each other. So what we want to be able to say is, if we have issues on the economy side, if we have trade-offs or opportunities to calculate what's the value of that in health terms and in social terms. How do we compare these different things? Because ultimately we need to come up with a package of options and outcomes that creates the best overall social economic impact. And then we need to deal with the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, we can make projections, but everybody knows that those projections are merely a central case scenario. Uh, the infection rates that are underlying what's happening could have been higher or lower than we knew. So we need to recognize that a point-wise estimate is not going to help us solve the problem. We need to develop an approach that is resilient to different types of outcomes. So let's start with infections, daily cases. This is the data that would have been available up to October. And then the choice is, how might we change that trajectory of cases? So when we think through November, we could have continued upwards, and that the yellow mark is the SPI-M projection uh, issued on the 28th of October, which um, assumes some of but not all of the tiering and saying if we continued in that way, that's what would happen. We could reduce mobility, and to varying degrees of reduced mobility, we could have achieved different trajectories for caseload. Now that is something that we have put together after the fact, and in particular that 22% reduction in mobility refers to what actually happened in the English national lockdown, and as a result, we saw caseloads dropping. So this is what we would need to have looked at, and then said, how does that translate into infections during the period, and how do we relate that to different levels of reduced mobility? So this will be the first piece of evidence that we'd need to develop and say that's our starting point, a set of assumptions based on what we've seen in the past, based on international evidence and so forth. Then with that, we can start to say, what are the big impacts that we're worried about? Well, the two that we would start with are the mortality rates that would come from these different infection levels and also the economic consequences of the reduced mo mobility. So when we look at the mortality rates, we see that if we had not changed mo mo mobility, we would likely have had a net mortality rate of around 36,000 as a result of direct and indirect effects. As we reduce more, more mobility, we would see that the mortality rate would go down as the infection rate goes down, all the way down to um, around uh, <coughs> 21,000 if we had 28% um, reduction in mobility. And then likewise, we can see what would happen on the economic side when we look at the impact of reduced mobility, meaning people are not going out shopping, people are not going to work as much as they might otherwise have. And therefore, we see a, a cost, something from zero, where which will be the same as we're expecting, all the way to 14, 18 billion economic cost as a result of the lack of mobility. But these are not the only things we have to consider. And in a finely balanced judgment, it's really important to think in a much broader, more holistic way at other effects that are also very important. So when we look at this, we see that actually the uh, lives lost are a very, very important thing to consider. But also on the health dynamic, we would be having also reduced levels of long COVID, reduced illness, morbidity as a result of the lower level of infection. So that's one thing we have to also add in to our consideration. And also the hospital capacity question that we, that we discussed. As we uh, free up capacity, we'll be able to bring those other operations back in. Now, on the flip side, we also have to think about mental health. How do we value that? Because that has a real impact. Likewise on education, likewise on the costs of well-being that comes from the fact that people cannot meet. There's a real value that we have to attribute to the fact that people cannot engage and meet with their friends and their families and get the, the joy of life from those interactions. So to do all that, we need to find a way of comparing these different effects. And as Philippa said, we are not um, doing a, a new piece of work. We are relying on the established methods and we're going to work with what the Treasury have historically done to calculate these impacts. So in a standard impact assessment from the Treasury, the Green Book advises certain 
ways of converting these different impacts into, into a common factor. So when we look at that, the um, traditional way of a quality adjusted life year captures the value of having one extra year of good quality life. And what, would we, what do we typically pay for that through the NHS, through policy changes? And uh, the Green Book, the Treasury Green Book, says that £60,000 is the conversion factor when looking at the costs of a policy and the quality adjusted life years that we could benefit from a good quality policy, whether it be road safety, changes to hospital practice, and so forth. Likewise, when we look at uh, qualities, these are quality adjusted, or sorry, the well-bees, these are well-being years. Uh, this captures the way of looking at people's life satisfaction. And again, the standard way of converting that is 7.5 well-bees for one quality adjusted life year. So this conversion factor allows us to compare the impact of people's well-being and satisfaction with life, the health of, the, of, of people, and the economic productivity of the nation, so that we can find a way of determining an in-the-round impact of everything that we're dealing with in this pandemic. So when we do that and say, let's take the current situation, because the standard practice for impact assessment will be to say, let's start with the current policy, and if that continues, what impact would it have? And what we've done here, and this is on, on the basis of a, of a quite complicated model that we have uh, developed to account for all these different factors, we look at the long-term and short-term costs. Uh, we look at the health costs, the social costs, and the economic costs. And what you see here is we've also determined and evaluated those costs in quality-adjusted life years, and a financial number as per the treasury conversion factor. So when we look at the, the health impact, what we're looking at is there would be 123,000 daily infections as per the SPI-M forecast. And we're taking the forecast that was available to the government at the time. This would lead to some overcapacity, 1,300 beds uh, beyond what the uh, capacity of the NHS would normally have and 36,500 deaths. These are our estimates using uh, the knock-on consequence of the infection plus Department of Health and Social Care analysis of the um, other indirect effects of, of COVID, both from the recession side of uh, the equation, but also from the knock-on consequences of capacity in constraints in the NHS. Then we would look at the economy. What, what's happening to the economy if we kept going under the, the tiered system? That um, best estimate would be around 7.5% GDP less than would have been under the trend, the long-term trend from 2019. We would have had about 50,000 extra uh, people unemployed, and that would have its own knock-on effects in terms of poverty uh, and deprivation. And then the social impact, we're looking at around 2.1 million wellbeings would have been lost in November uh, because of the lack of social contact and people's depression and anxiety. So that gives us a sense of the sort of the ledger, as it were, for the base case of keeping the tiered approach. And on one level, it's a, quite a you know, sobering assessment of quite the scale of the impact of, of the pandemic in just one month. So we say to ourselves, what if mobility were reduced what would the impact look like? What would the ledger be like if we took a 10% reduction in mobility? And what you see is that the health impact would be improved. We would have had fewer deaths, uh, less long-term COVID, and as a result, you see the qualities, the quality impact, the quality cost, the quality adjusted life lost would be less under this 10% reduction. However, what you also see is the economic impact would also would be greater. So the levels of uh, unemployment, the levels of poverty, the lack of economic output will be significantly less. And when you add it all up, what you see is the total negative impact of a 10% reduction would actually be greater than the negative impact of um, continuing with the policy. So it may be the fact that the reduction wasn't enough. What if we did a higher level of reduction and we see pretty well the same pattern playing out? Greater health benefits, thank goodness for that, however, at quite a significant cost in the equivalent quality adjusted life years that would come from the economic loss and again, some greater social loss. And now let's go to where we have ended up. 
22% reduction in mobility. We have saved 13,000 lives versus the spy and central projection, or the, the, the sort of implications of the spy and central projection. But we have also had quite an economic hit, and we have had a uh, social cost. And the net effect is, as we increase mobility, or in decrease mobility and further reduce mobility, what we see is that the net impact is getting worse and worse. So this suggests, under these assumptions, and as Philippa says, these are a set of reasonably well-grounded assumptions, but the government would have to do its own calculations. It appears that if we take the standard Green Book view of a quality-adjusted life year, take the best knowledge that we can get about the likely value of mobility reductions in impacting both the health and the economy, under this set of assumptions, reducing mobility by the tw or mobility index by 22% would have had a negative impact. But this is not the only thing we have to have to consider, because maybe uh, under these situations we have a different view of that conversion factor for quality-adjusted life years, because. It's extraordinary times. It may be appropriate, and this is for our politicians to, to determine, it may be appropriate to value um, this differently so that we would say, while the actual intrinsic value of a life is, is immeasurable, our ability as a society, our choice to pay to save or extend life is a choice we have to make every day. If we chose to spend more on that because of the circumstances, maybe the best level of mobility reduction will be different. So what we see when we increase the conversion factor for qualities, that at 180,000 uh, or even 120,000, a 10% reduction in mobility would have been worthwhile. So if we change this conversion factor between uh, a quality-adjusted life here and the amount in policy terms we pay for it, we would say, if, it's, if, a, if the life year, quality just life year, is worth paying more for, we would then be willing to accept the mobility reduction, but to 10% at this, at this level. The other thing we have to consider, a factor, is it's uncertain. We do not know exactly how things are going to play out. So we're in October. Uh, the projections have been made about what would happen if nothing was changed, but those projections also, as you see from this slide, came with a high degree of uncertainty. The SPIM um, forecast had a central case, which we've just been looking at, but they also had a lower band and an upper band for higher or lower growth, underlying growth. And what you see from that is plus or minus 50%. That's a very big range. So they are very clear that you cannot be precise. So when making policy decisions, you have to say, well, what if it was higher? What if it was lower? Will that decision still be right? How do I develop a view that is resilient to some of the underlying uncertainties. I have to make a judgment call, but I have to recognize it's uncertain. And that would also be the case when we look at you know, some of the other mobility reduction assumptions, whether it be half the reduction or indeed down at the 22% uh, the reduction that actually happened. There's, there was always at the time of October some uncertainty about how that might have played out. So that means that we have to think through what would the right answer be depending on those levels of uncertainty. So let's go back to where we were. Average daily infections. That was what we were expecting as a result of different levels of mobility in the central scenario. Given the level of uncertainty, we need to think about an upper or lower bound to those, those levels. Quite a wide range, as you see. And on the yellow at the very left is the SPI-M range. And then further to the right is if we took the 22% reduction mobility, what was the likely range we'd have to manage to for decision-making purposes in October? That then leads us to needing to have a quantification of the different infection rates under these different scenarios. So we have to be able to say the central case scenario is what we used earlier through this presentation, but infection rate growth underlying could be higher, in which case we'd be seeing a world with higher infections, or indeed lower, in which case we'd be seeing a world with lower infections. And if those two higher or lower scenarios played out, retrospectively, would our decision be the right one? And how do we make sure that the decision we take is actually resilient to, to this uncertainty? So let's have a look at the decision we took, or the range we were looking at earlier on, 60,000 
pans for equality adjusted life year under the central case scenario. If underlying infection rate growth was higher or lower, we would see quite a different picture. Under the uh, higher one, which is the green, we would see that it would be worthwhile having some mobility reduction, even at 60,000 pounds for quality adjusted life year. Whereas if it was a low scenario, low infection growth rate scenario, you would see that no, no level of mobility reduction increases or improves the impact. And that starts to tell us something about um, the need for having a different approach across the country. Because in places like Liverpool versus the Southwest versus other places with different underlying growth rates, the best response to achieve a most positive impact would be potentially quite different. And of course, then, as we change our view about how we have that conversion factor for quality adjusted life year, the optimum scenario, again, would, would adjust. Because as we change that, uh, that balance, we will be more willing to reduce mobility in order to reduce the infection rate. So what we see here is that the optimum mobility re reduction in a high growth scenario with a high value would actually be the 22% that we actually experienced. So when we look at that, we then say the real thing that we need to help make this trade-off is a proper understanding of both the uh, degree of uncertainty, the higher or lower scenarios as well as the mid-case scenario, and the relative potential values we might put on how much we're willing to pay to extend a life year. And what you see when you look at that is that if you're willing to pay more to extend a life year and you believe the infection rate is high, you would want to have a fairly significant reduction in mobility. If, on the other hand, you follow the standard treasury practice uh, or if your underlying judgment is the infection rate growth is lower, you would have uh, potentially no mobility reduction or a modest, a modest amount. And it's that trade-off, that understanding of what are the drivers of the right level of mobility reduction we think is critical to a good impact assessment. So where does that leave us when we look back at what actually happened? Well, we went into national lockdown. On the mobility index that we have uh, calculated, the mobility rate went down on average about 22% across the critical factors of workplace mobility, retail and hospitality mobility. That had a significant positive impact on reducing caseloads and infections. Um, but at the same time, as we know, it also had a significant negative impact on the economy. And when we, when we look at that trade-off, we gained 102,000 quality adjusted life years from the health improvements as a result of November's uh, policies. However, in quality adjusted life years, we um, spent 240,000 quality adjusted life years to gain that 100,000. If you take the calibration of 60,000 and you believe you're a central, central case. On the other hand, if you took a view that uh, the more uh, higher growth scenario was more likely to have been the true case, and if your view was that in the circumstances we're in, the Treasury standard uh, measurement of quality just life here is inappropriate, it should be higher, you would then be saying the lockdown uh, was the achieve the right level of mobility. Now, whether the lockdown from a policy point of view was the right way to achieve that mobility is a second question, which we want to keep separate. Because the first order is really understanding this dynamic between the mobility, the economy, and social well-being. And from that point of view, we would be saying, looking forward, evaluate locally. Look at local infection rates, local hospitalizations, local mobility. We also think it's really important to publish a local mobility index and alongside infection rates and actually start to develop a proper, well-grounded measurement of the level of mobility and mixing so that can get reported and recorded on a, on a real-time basis. Then establish a consensus for the, for the quality conversion factor. The quality adjusted life year is a critical part of this. And until we understand what we're paying for it and how we do that and how we balance it, it'll be very hard to have a reasoned debate about the right thing to do. Um, we need to adjust for declining infection rates as the, as the vaccine gets rolled out. The great news with the vaccine is that 
uh, for a given level of infection, mortality rates are going to go down. And therefore, any evaluation needs to continue to take that into account because with the rollout, it'll be possible to have higher levels of, of mobility for a given level of infections. And then build the evidence base on what it takes to change mobility. What are the best drivers? Are they guidance? Are they regulation? Are they public health information? Is it about local dashboards? That evidence base needs to be built up and worked on over time. And then finally, you repeat the exercise, rehearse it, prepare for January and February so that it's not done for the first time before the decision, but actually get the muscle memory worked up for this over the next month or two. Thank you. I'll hand back to Philippa. Uh, thank you so much for that, Stephen. Um, so what we've tried to share with you today is a framework, a way of approaching um, this challenge. Our hope is that government and other policymakers will look at this framework and they will ask themselves the question, how can we put our own numbers through this? How can we put our own data through this? What people are wanting to know is we are trading off uh, economic cost, health costs, social costs. We are trading the short term off against long term. They're wanting to know, are we making the right choices? And are we storing up problems for ourselves in the future? Or actually, do we need to be paying this price now because this is the right thing to be doing? And the public are looking for confidence in decision making. And our hope here is that in providing a framework of thinking, that government can then put their own data through, that this is a way of ensuring that the public can have real trust in decision making and in the way in which these big challenges, these once in a lifetime challenges are being dealt with and decisions are being taken. So we hope that this will be a hugely helpful tool that would be picked up and used by many people. Thank you.